Well, hello and welcome back to the Dragonfly Daily. If this is episode 34, then you all know who I am by now. I am Mike Marsh, the product manager at ORS, and you can follow me at Dragonfly Wizard on Twitter. Be sure to look for me on LinkedIn or ResearchGate if you need me, but also follow us on YouTube and visit ORSS.ca slash YTP2. That is the YouTube playlist for all of the Dragonfly Dailies. And while you're there, uh, subscribe to the channel so you can get access to all the content that we are producing, other webinar content, and other tutorial videos, etc. Today's topic, Lesson 34, Segmentation Wizard in Dragonfly 2020.1. As I say, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Also, give us a like to know, let us know that you're interested in new content, like what's happening in 2020.1, and that you're interested in image segmentation. Also, give us lots of comments so that we can engage with you and find out what people are getting out of these videos and make sure that we can continue to deliver uh, higher and better quality content for our customers on YouTube. Uh, as I say, the lesson is Lesson 34, Segmentation Wizard. We're also going to look at how multi-ROIs have been refactored in 2020.1, so you're going to see a little bit about what's new, and then we'll segue into the Segmentation Wizard. Today's lesson is done with Dragonfly 2020.1, Release Candidate 2. It is available on the Early Access page, for those of you that know where to find it, or if you're following this on the live registrations, then you're getting announcements, and you know where to access the Early Access page, so you can download the Release Candidate. The Release Candidate 2 is slightly different from the Release Candidate 1 that we posted on Monday, so you may want to download an update to Release Candidate 2 so you can follow along with today's exercises. We will move over now to Dragonfly 4.1 just briefly so I can showcase the differences in multi-ROI treatment between 4.1 and 2020.1. And, uh, I have my Dragonfly organizer open. I'm going to load a data set and then load these three ROIs. This is the same data set I think we looked at yesterday. This comes from Angel Paredes at the FDA, and these are rat neurons that were imaged by serial block base SEM on his Zeiss Merlin some seven or eight years ago. The data we're looking at, as I mentioned, I can turn on these ROIs. So we see here is a segmentation and uh, maybe I want to take advantage of the multi-ROI data structure and we can always take multiple ROIs, do a group select, right click and say create a multi-ROI. Now if you're using 4.1 then you'll see the behavior that I'm showing now. I'm going to delete these ROIs, I'm going to turn on the multi-ROI and the first thing we notice is there's no color preservation. The colors of the ROIs or the labels for that matter. This was labeled nucleus, this was labeled cytosol, or maybe cytoplasm, I think labeled cytosol, and this is labeled mitochondria. Those labels don't persist, the colors are lost, the coloring is just based on some lookup table that maps onto the different colors of the different labels by number. So not as useful as when you have them separated. Now, if I said, oh gosh, there's a hole in the cytosol here and I wanna patch it, if I select the multi-ROI and I go over to segment and I turn on the, the painter, I cannot activate the paintbrush. There is no way to paint directly on the multi-ROI. So if I'm using the multi-ROI structure and I want to edit it, now I have to right click and I must extract out the ROIs and now I don't have the label or the color, I just have uh, a label called multi-ROI from three ROIs, label one, two, and three. So if we look here at the nucleus or here at the cytosol, now I could come and select it and I could turn on a paintbrush and I could uh, make the changes. Then I could once again select them all, right click and create a multi-ROI. That hassle of not being able to edit the multi-ROIs, which forces you to extract individual ROIs and then recombine, that is what we are trying to overcome with some of the refactoring that we have done on multi-ROIs. I'm gonna close Dragonfly 4.1, discard changes, close Dragonfly. Now I'll switch over to my 2020.1 release candidate. Here's the same data set, so let's pull in the image channel, then we'll pull in the three ROIs doing a control click and then a drag, control click to do multi-select. Now here we have the same and I have the colors appropriate. Now if I select all three and I right click and say create a multi-ROI, uh, voila, we have a multi-ROI. Now I'm gonna multi-select these, delete, turn on the visibility of the multi-ROI and we have the, the same colors. If I select the multi-ROI, we'll see properties on the property panel. So I see the names and colors of each multi-ROI. I can turn off the opacity of any individual label. I can also change the color of any individual label. We can make it a darker blue if we want to, for example, and I could change the label. So if I didn't want to call this cytosol and I wanted to call it cytoplasm, which I wouldn't since I'm not including the mitochondria, but for example, I have. So I can change the labels, I can change the colors. Um, I do have a 2D opacity, and uh, I think in Release Candidate 2 there are some issues. We'll see where it work. it's working most of the time, but not all of the time. But this will affect the opacity of the entire multi-ROI, so all of the labels at the same time. Now, the 
Next thing I want to show you is suppose I were scrolling through and I said, oh, there's a spot in the nucleus that we have missed. I can select nucleus. I can come over to the ROI painter, select a 2D brush, and I can change the brush size like I normally would, and I can paint directly in here. Now, this is an immediate advantage, so I don't have to extract out the ROIs and then uh, edit and then recombine. Now, there is another feature I want to show you on here. There is the idea of a background class. So if I drag cytoplasm to the background class, for example, and I come down here and I do mitochondria, right now I have a mitochondria brush. So suppose I want to color this whole thing mitochondria. And then when I use the erase, it's going to erase and take everything. So I'm holding down control to paint and shift to erase. And the erase is putting whatever the color is of the background class. And the background class can change dynamically. So if I were in here and I wanted the nucleus to be the background class as I was erasing whatever, nuclear pore complexes or uh, nucleolus or whatnot, and I wanted to erase to restore to the nucleus, then you have that feature. So that gives you a dynamically rechangeable background class, or you can select none, in which case, uh, if I paint, I paint, and when I erase, it erases to this um, unlabeled state. So this is label one, label two, label three. There's also an implicit label zero in this multi-ROI that is for the unlabeled pixels. So you can, you can already see the differences between the multi-ROI in 4.1 and the multi-ROI in 2020.1. So that's an important change and it will make you more productive when you are doing segmentation. It'll make you more productive when you're doing deep learning segmentation because it's easier to iterate. That is, you can make a segmentation, train a model, then you can make predictions with that model and now edit them directly rather than having to extract out the ROIs and make corrections and then recompile them. We're actually going to see this iterative process stream Lined by the segmentation wizard, the top, which is the, the main topic for today. If you happen to catch the CCEM lectures that were part of the McMaster electron microscopy image processing course in late April, that was the topic of our lecture on Friday of that week was the segmentation wizard. That's a 90 minute or maybe a 75 to 90 minute presentation. Here we're going to do it in about 10 minutes, so we're not going to be able to see too much, but that is the topic for today's segmentation wizard. Now, before I get into that, I will show you uh, one more feature of the multi-ROI. This multi-ROI we're looking at, it has three labels, cytoplasm, nucleus, and mitochondria. Suppose I were to right-click on the mitochondria and extract this ROI. Now, I'm going to turn off the visibility of my multi-ROI. Here is an ROI of my different mitochondria. I can, as before, I can right-click and go to Connected Components and do a multi-ROI analysis. Now I have a table of several hundred, uh, nearly 1,200 mitochondria. Now maybe some of those are false positives. We could use our normal tools for editing and refining and pruning, but I'm just going to use this to compute a measurement such as volume. And now I hit OK, and now I have the volume computed on all the mitochondria. So some are just a few pixels wide and some are much bigger. So I'm going to have the volume reported in cubic microns. Now if I close this, we have this multi roy right here. If I select the multi roy you'll see in this list I now have uh, several hundred multi several hundred different objects. Now you see colors over here. Now let's look at at this. So I have the a name of each phase. I have uh, the number of labeled pixels, and I have a label index. If I want to refer to a measurement, I could refer to the volume measurement. And now all of a sudden they are all colored by that volume coloring table that we saw before in the objects analysis. So I can scroll through the list. I can uh, pick one. So if I uh, pick any one of these. I can always right click on it and say look at center of mass. Now this one is centered in the field of view to see exactly where it is. You can see, ah, this is the one right here. Now the reason it's appearing red is because this is still turned on. But if I turn off the visibility on and off, we can see that individual mitochondrion or something has been labeled as a mitochondrion. I think it's real. Now this gives me this list. I can't change these colors because they're part of this volume measurement. But if I switch back from volume to none, then uh, I revert back to my individual labels and colors, so I could give it uh, any color I want in this view. So this does, does give me access to the entire statistical measurement data set. I can delete and add additional labels to this. So I have the same flexibility that you need in a multi-ROI, and I can edit the multi-ROI by adding and removing, changing colors, changing names, and of course I can now do painting and adding. We will be adding more features as we increment and move closer to the next version of Dragonfly. All of the features you're used to for editing ROIs, all of the tools on the ROI tools panel such as morphological operations, fill operations, uh, clip operations, etc. These will all be uh, integrated in the near future to work directly on individual labels. 
Right now, the behavior you have is you can right click on any one of these, you can clear, um, you can remove that label class, you can extract as an ROI, uh, and there are a few other tools there. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and remove all of this from my workspace so we can go ahead and talk about the segmentation wizard. Um, in this case, I am going to open up the organizer again, in this, and I'm going to grab the uh, denim data set that we looked at yesterday. Just a reminder, this is the data set that comes from uh, Rigaku, uh, collected on their Nano 3DX. These data are courtesy of Aya Takasa and colleagues at Rigaku Americas. So I want to segment this, and I want to segment the small fibers and the large fibers and the background. And uh, thresholding doesn't work very well, and uh, manual painting will take too long, so we want to use deep learning. However, the segmentation wizard allows us to make the deep learning process go forward. What you can do is you can right click on an image channel, scroll down or uh, move down in the list and choose segmentation wizard. This will take you, let's see if we can adjust the screen size so you can see captions. That seems to be working. This takes you into the segmentation wizard context. Now you have a limited set of tools on the left and on the right you have this new tab. Um, in the segmentation wizard, we see three tabs over here, input, models, and settings. And on the input, we see frames and classes and labels. What we will do here is we will identify areas where we will prepare training data, and then we will train multiple models. And we will investigate the results of each model and use that to uh, provide more training data and then refine the model further. We can get started by adding a frame. This means I can zoom in on the image and I can click add. What this does is it creates a single frame, uh, so I scrolled away from that slice, a single frame where we will prepare training data. I can uh, move around the image and at any time I want, I can recall that frame. So I can uh, fit to view and now we see that frame on slice 417. Now, as soon as you create a frame, it will create a two class system. In our case, we're actually gonna make a three class system. I'm gonna call the first one air and then I'm gonna call the second class big fibers and I'm gonna call the second cl third class, I'm gonna add one more class, I'm gonna call this small fibers. And I'm gonna change the color of air to a dark blue and change the big fibers to a bright blue. And I'll leave small fibers as this sort of orangish color. Now, what we can do is we can prepare training data here, and there are different ways of preparing training data. We can prepare very dense training data where we try and label every pixel, or we can prepare sparse training data where we paint just a few pixels in the field of view. I'm gonna start by that second mechanism, painting a sparse set of training data. What I can do is I can uh, click on air, I can go to my ROI painter. Now you'll normally find ROI painter docked over here. I've just undocked it uh, to give myself access to it over here. So with air selected, turn on ROI painter. How do I make this taskbar go away? Go away taskbar. Uh, windows. All right, we'll leave it up there. Now, um, you see that I have the painter tool selected, and so I could select the paintbrush, select a circular brush, and I could paint some air here. I cannot paint out here. I'm holding down the mouse button, but it doesn't paint when I get outside the frame. So I could try and paint a little air here and there, and I could try and paint the big fibers and the small fibers. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on define range, hit upper Otsu, and now with the big fibers, I'm gonna drag the brush and capture some of these big fibers, just a few pixels here and there, and likewise for the small fibers. So um, if we now turn off the fine range, you can see I've only painted a few reference pixels, so I have a very sparse painting. This is enough to get started. What happens when I hit the train button is it looks at all of the frames, in this case there's just one frame, and it looks at the training data available, and then it decides what models can Dragonfly use to train with this sparse limited data. Um, in the initial stage, if you have sparse data, it will create a couple of segmentation trainer models. So recall from our week on, um, well, at, on, at some point we had a lesson on the segmentation trainer. So this is actually using a random forest model. It's actually training two different random forest models because those work with sparse data. So it will train a couple of models and then it will use those models to make predictions on this area. And then we can evaluate the prediction. We can see which one performs better and then we can use that prediction to augment our training set. So you'll see what I mean in a minute. Now, you can look on the bottom and say, okay, it did a good job on the air, but it did a pretty lousy job on small versus big. I mean, it's not totally terrible that these are small fibers in here and those are uh, uh, 
uh, mostly small and these are big and they're mostly labeled big. Predictions are not very different between these two models, but I can take this and I can say promote this and now I can edit this. Many times editing this will go faster than just painting, painting a dense frame from scratch. So I can come in here and what I can do is I can select two channels at the same time. I don't mean channels, I mean labels. If I do a control select and select two, now what happens is when I use the paintbrush, if I hold down control, my paintbrush will be blue. If I hold down shift, my paintbrush will be orange, blue, orange. And this means I'm not actually gonna overwrite any of the air pixels. All of the pixels that could be orange or blue, I can now switch from one state to the other. So if I'm holding down control and I'm dragging over here, I'm changing all of these to blue. And I don't have to worry about being careful in the air region because I'm not gonna change any of the air. Now I am gonna adjust the opacity so I can get an idea. Okay, so pretty much everything in here is small and everything else is big. So we'll do this, make it, make my brush bigger, go a little more quickly, and all right, how's that look? All right, so pretty good, and now I'll do the changes inside orange, so now I'm holding down the shift, and go through and label these. All right, let's have another look and see what we think of the data. So pretty good. And what we wanna do here is just create some training data that it can use for the next round of training. Now, this is still just one frame. Now, what I could do is I could go to another frame. So let's scroll through the data and we can find different areas that have different texture that we wanna represent. So scrolling down here, scrolling up, and I do have some over here that give us more cross-sectional texture or sort of these longitudinal cut on the fibers. So I could add another frame here. Now I have two frames. This frame I could paint from scratch or I could make a prediction with these frames. So if I hit predict, it will take the two models that have already been trained and it will apply the prediction to this area. Then I can promote that and then edit. Now it might be faster at this point for me to edit an existing prediction, or it might be faster for me, for me to paint a new training uh, data set de novo. I'm actually gonna do the latter after the prediction because I think uh, there's one more feature I wanna show you over here on the panel that'll help you prepare training data quickly. So we'll let this proceed, and then we'll take these two patches after they're both painted, these two frames, and we'll train the model. At that point, instead of having just sparse trained data like we did in the first iteration, we'll have dense trained data because all of the pixels in here will be painted, not just select pixels. So we can see the result. Now we haven't done any more training since the first uh, iteration. This is just using that trained model to make a prediction on this frame. So we can make as many frames as we want, make as many predictions as we want, or we can paint from scratch. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna turn on the define range, hit upper Otsu, and I'm gonna paint my big fibers. So let's start on the paintbrush and let's paint some big fibers. And I'm gonna paint some big fibers over here. Now I'm gonna paint some small fibers. Now I have the define range turned on, so my paintbrush is only painting pixels under the brush that match the define range criterion. All right, so I have some pixels painted, ready for uh, training. Uh, whoops, uh, what did I do? I did erase, I wanna do paint blue, very good. Now, uh, as you probably noticed, every pixel can only be labeled one color at a time. So there is no overlap. There is an exclusive function. So everything has to be painted either one color or another. Now I can turn off define range and we say, okay, we've densely painted the blue and we've painted the orange, but we haven't painted the background. I can, for this frame, right click and say, label all of the unlabeled voxels, add them to this class. And now they're painted as blue. So I have two frames. If I look at this frame, it's, it's ready. And if I look at this frame, it's ready. And so we can take this and we can train again. Now, uh, before I, I'm gonna go here and now I'm gonna hit train. Now, what it's doing right now is it's going to train the existing models, that is this random forest model and this random forest model. It's gonna train it, but now with more data. After it's done that, it will establish that it has sufficient data to train some deep learning models. So 
I'm making a distinction here. The sparse training was sufficient for training the random forest models. For training the convolutional neural network or the deep learning models, it needs the densely trained data. After it trains these two models, it will now create additional models that are suitable using convolutional neural networks. So I think it's going to create uh, three different classes, two or three different classes, or two or three different models, that is, of type uh, UNET and type sensor 3D and type autoencoder. So there is a heuristic that it's using for uh, choosing what models to train. And we will be working in future versions to make more and more of these heuristics that you can create and make your own rules. So we may have one iterative heuristic for biological SEM data and another for uh, uh, SEM material science data. So this is designed to be as generic as possible. But we recognize that we may be making um, fine tuned versions of the heuristic. Now, that is to say that this heuristic tells Dragonfly which models to create based on input conditions. However, you can, anytime you want, input existing models. So you can click the plus button to create a new model of the architecture you want with the right number of classes. You can also import existing models. So if you want to complement these two models with a model you already know is a good start, you can import that into the workspace. Now what's happening right now is it's training the, the autoencoder model and it's, uh, as with deep learning model, it's going to repeat for several epochs. Now if I let that finish, it's gonna go through 100 consecutive epochs or it will early stop if early stopping conditions are met. That is, if the validation score stops falling, it may, it may stop prematurely if there's no point in continuing more training. Now I'm gonna stop this prematurely and interrupt it because it has two more models that I wanna let it to train. And we can't spend all day looking at blue progress bars or we can't spend all of the Dragonfly daily. We are gonna spend a few more minutes looking at blue progress bars. So it's finished training the um, UNET model uh, or which model was it? Was it the autoencoder model? Now it's training the UNET model and I'll let it go for two or three epochs and then I'll let it train the third model and then we'll see what happens when it uses that those models for making predictions. You'll notice here the scoring function is including not just the loss function but it is also reporting the ORS dice coefficient, which is a score that can be used for image segmentation to determine how strong a segmentation is based on accuracy. And of course, accuracy here is comparing to the training data. So it's training on these data sets. It's doing the same thing we did when we used the deep learning model uh, directly. That is when we use the deep learning tool, it is extracting out patches and creating a library of known or ground truth data that it shuffles and then sets some aside for validation. Then it takes some and does data augmentation and then it does the training. So it's gone for three and a fraction epochs. I'm gonna stop it so it has time to load up the third model and start training it. The whole workflow here is designed around helping you create training data with less human interaction. So if you're going to need three or four or five slices of training data in the end, rather than making you spend 20 or 30 minutes painstakingly paint every pixel and every slice from scratch, you can start with a small patch, train a model, then make a prediction on a bigger patch, train a better model now that you have a bigger prediction, and then you can train an entire slice. And maybe you have almost no correction to do or just a little bit of corrections to do. And it goes much faster than training, training five or six slices uh, from scratch. I may have been wrong about the number of models that it thinks is suitable. It may not be loading the third model. It may be sticking just with the two random forest models and the two uh, deep learning models. After it has trained all of the models, it evaluates all of the models and then scores them. Um, and then it will show you the result of the best scoring models for the currently selected frame. So it's currently evaluating the models, it's gonna come up with the score, and then it's gonna show us the prediction on the currently selected frame. So we see that there are in fact four models. It's gonna be showing three at the bottom of the screen, and it's showing them sorted by scores. So it thinks the UNET did the best job, followed by the autoencoder, followed by random forest with activation map two, followed by random forest with morphological Gaussian uh, uh, filter, filter, I want to call them feature vectors or filter banks uh, in last place. So we're going to let finish doing this evaluation and show us the results on screen. This is a very useful way of comparing different models. So even if you weren't using the segmentation trainer or sorry, the segmentation wizard to build up more training data, you could go into the segmentation wizard 
and then you could import uh, four or five or six models and then ask it to evaluate and then you would see how does it do on those different models so here we see this area and we see oh the prediction here is is much better than before um, quite similar to these two models uh, even this model is pretty good with uh, with this increase in training data now I don't want to promote this because I did a good job on this I don't want to overwrite it but I could go to another slice and do uh, I could go to another slice and do another round of uh, training so I could come here and say oh let's uh, create another frame so I'll hit add and now we have a third frame and I could at this point make a prediction with this frame and it's going to predict with all three models it will apply to this frame and then I can take whichever one I want and then promote it and edit it now while it's making the prediction I'll just uh, repeat some of the things over here so there's the input tab the models tab and the settings tab the input tab is where you as a user are able to define the different frames you can delete frames at any time and you can always recall a frame by uh, just clicking on it this is something that gives us a big advantage over before before when you were preparing draining data you might have to take a pencil and write down okay I have some training data on slice 73 and 95 and if you don't write it down it may be hard to find so this uh, immediately solves that problem of knowing exactly where your training data are so the top half of this is dedicated to the frames the next half is dedicated to the different labels you're using for training data and so you have the same capabilities like you saw in the property panels for a multi roy you can change the uh, color change the name change the visibility change the opacity you can also designate a background class like we saw before so you can train the models with the existing training data or you can make a prediction on the current frame there is also the models tab which allows us to see the models that have currently been generated and their scores and allows us to toggle their visibility and whether they're being used I think for making predictions now uh, after this finishes I will show you the behavior of the exit button which is to say you can exit the segmentation wizard all of the data for your training all of the models are stored and encapsulated and you can re-enter the segmentation wizard when you need to so this does give you the flexibility to come back to this work without losing your training data or losing any of the status of your segmentation wizard so just to recap the whole idea here is to make it easier for you to generate more training data and train your models iteratively so that you're not spending all of your time preparing data from scratch so five years ago the way you would segment uh, challenging data is you might have to manually paint every slice manually very pain and painful and labor-intensive you know one year ago the solution is you might paint five to ten slices manually then train a deep learning model and then paint everything else automatically now the solution is you don't even paint those five to ten slices manually from scratch you use this tool to iteratively build up your training data set so you've got less manual labor going into it less human interaction so after these blue progress bars are finished we'll look at sort of what the previews look like on this slice so we can see uh, what they look like and uh, we can as I was mentioning over here we can change uh, which models we're going to look at so if I remove the third model because I don't like it then I'll see the these two and they'll be uh, enlarged and take up more space there is a synchronized zoom and pan also I will draw your attention to um, this on the frames you do have the option to right click on any frame you can fill from prediction which will take the selected and it's the same as pushing this button uh, and it pro promotes it up there is also fill from object which is to say if you've already done some manual segmentation maybe you've imported some manual segmentation from another tool or you've done it in the main dragonfly context you don't have to start your segmentation here with the paintbrush tool you could fill this frame with a multi ROI so if I click fill from object it'll look in my workspace for any multi ROIs that qualify and then it'll allow me to fill in this frame directly so that's a way of bootstrapping or importing uh, your initial segmentation from something that already exists outside the segmentation wizard the last tab I'll show you is settings so every time you draw a new frame you could have it automatically com compute predictions you can also change the behavior of what's happening at during the iterative process change the total number of models that can be evaluated and generated now I told you that I would be clicking the exit button when I click the exit button it saves all of the state information and we have this something called a context group at any point I can export this to save it and reload it in a session later or I can reopen the segmentation wizard and it'll take me right back to where I am well that is it that is what I wanted to show you today about the segmentation wizard and about refactoring a multi roys now I'm going to go back over to my slides and say it is time for questions and answers 
And uh, with that, let me pull up my questions and answers panel. People have already uh, put forth a bunch of questions. All right, so uh, at the top of the hour before we started the recording, we did talk about moving to Dragonfly Weekly, and I do have lots of thumbs up for people that says you want me to continue it live so you have the opportunity to ask questions. Well, that's more work for me, but if you guys get a lot out of it, then I think we can find a way to do Dragonfly Dailies live. All right, next question. Can you open a project save with 4.1 in 2020.1? The answer is yes. So you can save the session or the ORS object. Those data sets are forward compatible. They are usually not backwards compatible. We often do introduce new features into a project uh, file type that you might not be able to load in older versions. So you have to be careful with that. But you can always save the individual ORS objects and they're most likely capable of being opened in older versions. All right, next question. Can you use the, say, volume analysis you did to get rid of false identified structures, say all of those tiny mitochondria identified? Well, sure you can. And uh, um, I'm not sure which lesson you want to look at to see that. It's probably lesson 10, advanced segmentation. But um, it's uh, certainly worth seeing a couple of times. So I'll just hit search and do viz demo and pull it up once more. So we'll take this and we'll bring in the mitochondria. Let's close this, close this, close this stupid Windows control panel. Um, so here's my mitochondria. If I right click and I say uh, connecting components multi roy analysis, if I look at this table, I have uh, uh, volume, I have labels, I don't have any measurements. If I were to compute volume, uh, now I have a volume measurement. And something I can do is I can go to a histogram view of volume and I see, wow, 99% of these are in the first bin that are only a few pixels wide. I could even create a filter and zoom in on those and say, okay, some of these are real, but let's say uh, all of these and this is this cluster right here. These 999 are the smallest of the small. And if we look at the table for those, we can see these are, you know, they're nanoscopic. These aren't even a, a cubic micron. And so these are very, very tiny. And so we could just take all of these 999. Now this is different from the set of all. So this is a list of all 1140. This is a list of the 999 that were just uh, tiny and small. Let's turn this off so you can see it better in the view. So right now we don't see anything in this view um, because these are all so tiny. Now, if I do this and then I just uh, delete this from the ROI, now I come here and remove the filter, and now we're down to 141, and these are probably mostly real, and we can go back to the histogram and see this is my histogram of mitochondria size. So uh, I think that probably is a two and a half minute answer to that question. Now, let me look at the time. All right, we do have time for more questions. So that answers that question. Next question, would the segmentation wizard be able to separate the cortical cortex from the inner trabecular structure, seeing that contrary to fiber example, they're actually continuous? Uh, yes, so there's preliminary work. I'm not sure that it is published, but yeah, you can use deep learning to separate cortical from trabecular. Next question, what about training parameters? For example, patch and batch size, are these automatically optimized based on application and hardware available? So the segmentation wizard is specifically designed to help you move forward without having to have any expert knowledge. The segmentation wizard does not let you change the parameters of patch and batch size on the models that it generates. However, you could create your own models with the deep learning tool and import those and tell, Dragon, tell, deep, tell segmentation wizard to use those models instead of the ones that it generates heuristically. So those are obscured for you, but if you're an expert, you can take advantage of that. Does the control shift exclusive work in multi-ROI classes too? Yes, so you can select any two classes and hold down control and shift and it will only modify either of those two classes. Very powerful, not intuitive. Once you've used it for 10 seconds, you'll be very grateful you know about it, but you wouldn't stumble upon it accidentally. So you do need to keep in mind, you have to select two classes, then hold down control or hold down shift. The paintbrush changes color and that's very helpful for you too. Next question, can we use a loaded convolutional network for prediction in the wizard? Yes, you can. So in the segmentation wizard, you can uh, uh, use import. So. Uh, if we uh, return and we do reopen segmentation wizard, it's going to take a minute to reopen everything and then pull open uh, some predictions. So while that goes, I'm going to go on to the next question. 
Did I say that RC2 is different from the Monday version? Yes, it is. So there, um, if you want to try out Segmentation Wizard, I think you might need to update from Release Candidate 1 to Release Candidate 2. I don't know the details that are different. I just know the team identified some issues and wanted to have an, uh, a, a fresher Release Candidate available for you to use. Okay, I've answered that question. I'm going to come back over here. If you look and you see um, under models, I can click the, I can take any one of these models at any time. I can see some of the parameters and I can save that model. I can also import a model. Now, the only models that I can import are models that have the right number of classes. So if I am trying to train a three class model and I only have four class models in my library, then this import will show up empty. But you see that some models I've already trained in different exercises are there. So I could take one that I've already done on Denim and I could import it. So you can import models. Like I say, you could import multiple models or models that collaborators have done and use this as a test bed for comparing the performance of those models and getting on-screen visualizations of both at the same time, rather than you know loading a model and making a prediction and loading the other model and making a prediction. The segmentation wizard allows you to compare the outputs of multiple models uh, side by side. All right, back to questions and answers and pull up my Q&A. Next question, uh, do we have a timeline for when 2020.1 will be out of beta and into release? Well, you're welcome to use it right now. Um, the release candidate, there is a code freeze. No one's working on any new features. No one's even working on bug fixes. We're only on a point where if someone identifies uh, critical bugs or showstopper bugs, as we might say, then they'll be fixed. Otherwise, the release candidate, once it's been in the clear for I don't know, some time period, maybe three to five days, then it will become the production release and we'll ship it. So look for it very soon. Uh, next question, do you recommend applying filter before using segmentation wizard for some data set or does the wizard include filtering? Um, well, Keqing, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I guess sometimes it is very useful to have the data filtered. It makes it easier for you to paint. The segmentation wizard does not do the filtering for you. So if there's some, some discussion to be had. This could be a very long discussion about should you apply filtering um, because in fact, the deep learning could work directly on the unfiltered data. And in some cases that's preferable. Uh, that's the basis of a lecture we gave last month on image processing is not what you want to do. But um, that's kind of a academic thought experiment. It's not a, a general universal guidance. So I would say that a lot of the time you can benefit from applying a filter before you go into the segmentation wizard. So you can use the lessons we taught you here in filtering to apply a filter and then it may make it easier for you to paint the training data. Um, next question. Uh, downloading R1 was fine yesterday, but R2 starts and then gives a network error. Mm, are you on the same network you were on yesterday? Um, uh, if you're having issues, you can send them to support at theobjects.com. Uh, I'm using the same release candidates that I'm telling you about. So the, uh, oh, you're, it starts. So you say you downloaded it or you can't download it. I'm not sure if you're saying it fails to launch or it fails to download. Um, but the release candidate two is here. So you can visit theobjects.com slash dragonfly slash early access.html and you can click this button and download has initiated. So you should see the same behavior on your side. And then once you install it, it should uh, run and activate as normal. There's no change there. All right. Oh, here's another question. Will segmentation wizard be exclusive for pro or also the non-commercial version? Uh, oh yeah, so the segmentation wizard is going to be available in uh, for anyone that has deep learning. Now this means if you are a non-commercial user, you do have access to deep learning and you will have access to the segmentation wizard. If you are a customer who has purchased Dragonfly or a customer who has purchased Dragonfly Pro, um, if you have deep learning as part of your license, then you will be eligible to use segmentation wizard. So as long as you have deep learning, you will have access to segmentation wizard. And it just happens to be the case that deep learning is included on all the non-commercial licenses and it's uh, not included on pro licenses by default. You can always purchase it from Zeiss if you are a Dragonfly Pro customer or if you're a Dragonfly customer, uh, you may have already purchased uh, the deep learning with it. All right, I think there's a follow-up on this question. The multi-ROI opacities don't seem to work in RC1, not sure about RC2 yet. So there is an intermittent issue I'm working right now to identify uh, when the opacity fails and when it is working so we can make sure that that is stable and useful. So sorry, that's not working uh, fully for you, but it will be resolved. All right. 
I don't see any more questions. So uh, thank you all for your attention. If you happen to be someone who signed up for the Bone Segmentation Collaboration, we will be seeing you shortly and uh, we'll see you in that webinar. Thank you all again and everyone have a great day and we'll see you again tomorrow and I think we'll talk about the Bone Analysis Wizard tomorrow. Uh, so everyone have a great day and take care. Bye-bye.